Well, hello everyone. My name is Andre. I work here at Brookfield Zoo and I am really excited today that you're joining us for our 10-minute Monarch Marvel. And today we are going to spend about 10 minutes talking about one of the marvels in the Monarch life cycle. And we're going to focus in on the basics of the Monarch life cycle. And the basics are, it begins, they eat, they change, and repeat. But this brings up a good question. Which came first, the butterfly or the egg? Now, I've never been able to ask that about the chicken, so if anybody has an answer on this, please let me know. But for our purposes today, we are going to start off with an adult female. So I think probably the first thing to do is to give everybody an orientation as to how we might be able to tell a female from a male. So if you look to your left, you're going to see a photo of a female. You see that arrow coming from the top of the screen? That big black line, that is a vein. And the females have thicker veins than compared to the male on your right. Now, if you also look at this little vein going down towards the back of the female's wing, it's one straight line. Whereas if you see the male on your right, there looks like there's a dot there. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to focus our attention on the one to your left, the female monarch, because she is our mother in the story. Now, as we advance, what do you notice this adult butterfly doing? And if you want to throw some things in the chat, that is totally fine. But what do you notice about this adult butterfly? I think, yeah, I'm sensing some people noticed that it was walking and touching those flower petals with its feet quite a bit. And butterflies actually taste with their feet. This is how they taste the plants that they're on and use that long proboscis to sip nectar. Now, this mother is eating with a purpose. And the purpose that this mother is eating with is to bring a new life into the world. Now, if you take a look at that little oval on that green stalk, that's how a mother butterfly starts the life of her young. Her young life starts and begins inside of an egg. Now, how might this egg be protected for three to four days? You got any ideas on that? Starting to sense, and people say, mom might try to hide the egg, may try to shelter it. Very good observations. Take a look at these monarchs here on something called milkweed. How do you think milkweed might help a mother monarch who is looking for a place to raise her young, but also might be hungry? I uh, bet if you put it on the underside of the leaf. Yep, on the underside of the leaf. Thank you very much. So the underside of the leaf could provide some shade from the sun. And these eggs are about the size of a period at the end of the sentence. So under that leaf would be a nice place to hide from predators. And if my monarch is hungry, take a look at what she's doing. Kind of similar to what we saw in the video. So milkweed is extremely important for the monarch butterfly's life cycle, especially the caterpillar, because it's the only food monarch caterpillars will eat. It provides them safety and provides shelter. Whereas for the adults, it's one of many nectar-giving plants they can get nutrition from as they fly on their way through their great migration. Once this little monarch caterpillar finds its way out of the egg, what do you think this caterpillar does for the next 10 to 14 days? You know, some people say, you know, you should stop and smell the flowers every once in a while. I don't know, you think that caterpillar is just stopping to smell the flowers, kind of sense them with its antenna? Uh, he's eating. Eating! I have some very observant people out there for 10 to 14 days. The monarch caterpillar eats and grows. Look, what do you notice about it eating? 
See that green stalk that it's chewing on? Well, that green stalk is really important and it connects with that monarch caterpillar's coloration. Milkweed is a toxic plant. As the monarch caterpillar eats the milkweed, it itself becomes toxic. And these warning colors help let animals know, you don't want to eat me, you might get a bad stomach ache. So this is one of the reasons why milkweed is so important. Now after 14 days, we often talk about metamorphosis, but this is the amazing, marvelous change that they go through. How long does that process take, Andre? Somebody wants to know how long it takes. Well, as we see this process unfold, about 10 to 14 days. So when the caterpillar forms its chrysalis, and that's what butterflies develop in, takes about 10 to 14 days. After 10 to 14 days, an adult emerges from the chrysalis, and the cycle repeats. Now, if you take a look on there, we see three monarchs. Sometimes you'll have a male hatch out of an egg, sometimes a female, and then they may meet up someplace like around some asters. You think we have any females or males on that plant? Oh, no. uh, well, there's the females up at the top. Oh, ah, okay. And then there's a male on the right. Oh, ah, what gave it away? The okay. spots. Ah, okay, we see the spots over there on the right and yeah. those thick veins up there. And I would oh, guess the one on the there. bottom is a female too. And guessing the one on the bottom is a female too. So even with those wings folded, at times we can take a look and tell. Very good observations. Since milkweed is so essential to the monarch's lifestyle and its life cycle, it's very easy for us to surmise that if we have no milkweed, no monarchs. But more milkweed, more monarchs. And this is why here at the Chicago Zoological Society, which operates Brookfield Zoo, we are really excited to be part of a collaborative effort here in Illinois called the Illinois Monarch Project. We work together with friends of ours such as the Illinois Farm Bureau, the Chicago Zoological Society and the Illinois Farm Bureau are working with other organizations to support the Illinois Monarch Project's efforts to increase habitat for monarch butterflies here in Illinois, to maintain existing habitat, and to help people along the way. So the Illinois Monarch Project's campaign is Pledge, Plant, Post. Pledge, how you'd like to support monarchs, Plant milkweed wherever you can and other native nectar giving plants and share your activities to help bring awareness. Now there's so much to talk about. We really appreciate you joining us. Thanks for tuning in for our 10 minute Monarch Marvel and we hope that you join us next time as we discuss their great migration. So Andre, we've got some questions. Excellent, I'm glad to hear that. How many eggs can a female lay at one time? One egg. Female monarchs lay one egg, and this is why it's extremely important to help them along the way. So one egg at a time. And uh, some people think that milkweed grows too fast and it might become a, a weedy problem. Is there any way that you can plant milkweed and keep it from getting to be too... Um, too populous in your yard? Very good question. I would suggest taking a look at the type of soil that you have. Do you have clay-based soil? Do you have soil that's um, really wet and moist all the time, uh, such as you see in wetlands and marshland areas? Or do you have drier soil like you would see in the prairie? Once you find that out, then you can take a look at different species of milkweed that are local to Illinois. So common milkweed, which um, is most advantageous for monarchs, tends to grow pretty tall. It can be about six to eight feet tall, and it can populate pretty quickly. 
However, if you don't want that in your area, there are other options, such as butterfly milkweed. Some areas, prairie milkweed, showy milkweed could work. Even downstate Illinois, they have a really cool milkweed called green antelope horn. And if you're over, say, by Sand Ridge Nature Center out in uh, close to northwest Indiana, where you do have a lot of poor soil, swamp milkweed might be good. And some of these other milkweeds don't get as tall and don't populate as much as common milkweed. If people want to plant native plants in their yards to help um, monarchs, what kinds of resources are there? I mean, do they just go to the store and buy seeds or are there places that you would recommend that they shop from? Excellent question. When you're buying seeds to help pollinators, some of the things you want to look for is to make sure that the seeds are genetically pure and also that the seeds have not been treated with chemicals. Sometimes seeds are treated with chemicals to prevent pests and these types of things, and they can inadvertently harm pollinators. So one of the things to do would be to check at the Illinois Monarch Project. We work with them and we help provide resources from them, as does the Illinois Farm Bureau, uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources, Illinois Department of Transportation and our friends over at University of Chicago Energy Division. We all work together to make these resources available for people to help them out with these particular questions. There are also some people who um, find native plants to, to look like weeds. Mm -hmm. Are there native plants out there that are good for the, uh, not only the monarchs, but other pollinators, and also are really pretty and look like <laughs> like regular flowers and mm -hmm. not, not, you know, weedy grasses or something like that. Yes, definitely so. I would say to start with what you would like to accomplish in your garden. What do you want to, your garden to bring to you as far as how does it make you feel? Um, is there a functionality you're looking for? And then you can start to investigate the native plants. Grasses may or may not be great for your garden, whereas different types of wildflowers might be just what you're looking for. There are wildflowers that come in an array of different colors and an array of different heights. Purple cone flowers tend to get about waist high and they can repopulate very easily, but sometimes people want something a little shorter and a different color, so there's Indian blanket, Ohio spiderwort, lots of different native plants that you can get right here. One place that I have looked at before and um, found some information was a place called Applewood. Applewood Seed Company, and I had looked and saw that they had some um, information about native plants in your region. So again, it's not something that I can advocate and say, yes, go to that company, but I did want to let you know that from talking to people in the Illinois Monarch Project, and doing some research on my own, I have found some information there that might be useful. And how much do the monarchs rely on people um, planting in their backyards? There's an idea um, I'd like you to consider. We um, have worked closely with a project called Y to Y, Yellowstone to Yukon. And back in the 90s, Yellowstone to Yukon found that if you had bears in a conservation area like Banff National Park and they could not get to bears in Yellowstone National Park, there was really no way for that genetic diversity. So they started to build overpasses and underpasses to allow these animals, not just bears, but wolves and other animals to get across the highway. Monarchs need the same thing. There may be agricultural and fields and prairies full of milkweed. However, as monarchs travel up north and then back south through their migration, they're going to pass through cities. They're going to pass by backyards. These mother monarchs are going to be hungry and it may be time for them to lay an egg. So backyards, gardens in front of organizations such as libraries and other businesses can act as great pollination stations great stopovers to help adults feed and gain nourishment on their long flight. And if they have milkweed, can actually serve as a breeding ground and nursery for young monarchs starting on their life journey. 
So I think what you're saying is we don't have to have the entire state of Illinois be covered in milkweed. We just need these little, um, almost like rest stops. Yes, and, it's, um, and it really supports some of the, um, you know, information from our friends at Vital Ground, that it's not millions and millions of acres, for example, that you need to save grizzly bears. It's the acres in the right spot. And it's the same with the monarchs. You need the milkweed in the right spot so that as they travel, they're able to continue those generations until the large generation comes back. What other animals or insects would be supported by um, having native plants in your backyard? Any pollinator that you have. So whatever helps monarchs will help any of your bumblebees, your honeybees, your wild bees, the solitary ones. And if you have tubular flowers, it's really going to attract hummingbirds. Hummingbirds will come to your purple cone flowers, but if you're planting honeysuckle, these types of things, you'll start to see hummingbirds as well. And as you start to incorporate gardening techniques, such as companion planting, where some plants actually benefit other plants by being in close proximity, you start to find less of a need for chemicals. As you pull away from chemicals, you start to see different types of animals come back to the area, including amphibians, and you start to create an entire ecosystem. And one of the things that helps that ecosystem flourish, pollinators. And I will just make a note, when you say honeysuckle, you do mean the native honeysuckle. Please yes. do not plant Japanese or Amur honeysuckle. No. <laughs> so and it take over. Native uh, plants, the reason that we advocate so much for native plants is because when you start to use exotic plants and invasive plants, they can harbor parasites that can be fatal to monarchs and other pollinators. Also, you have different tropical milkweed that has different bloom seasons. So they can cause monarchs to stay around longer than they should and get caught in colder weather. So that's why native plants are much better. They're also resistant to our droughts that we have, our high temperatures we have, and our extreme weather changes. So native plants can also save you a lot of work in the long run. And non-native plants can also be allelopathic, which means they've got chemicals that mm -hmm. um, could actually um, damage insects or even your ground. Yes. Sorry, I could talk about that all day. Um, <laughs> Someone wanted to know if we could see the slide again comparing the male and female butterflies. Most definitely. Let's go back. Here we go. I'll go ahead and zoom in a little bit on there. So, can so you point out our you females? can see right here those two little dots on the male. This is a bit thinner. And here it's a bit thicker. No dot on those veins. All right, hang on. I think I skipped a couple questions here because they were coming in so fast. Um, how come butterflies will sometimes rest on a human? It could be that um, your skin tastes good. It could be that um, they feel that you're standing still for so long that you're a nice stable platform to rest on. But sometimes you will find insects attracted to you based upon the lotions that you use. The soaps that you use, sometimes they give off the same type of scent as the flowers that attract these animals. And how long does it go from um, when the caterpillar first hatches out of the egg until it forms a chrysalis? How long is, it, how is, how long is a monarch a caterpillar? Yeah, a monarch is a caterpillar <laughs> for about 10 to 14 days. So egg about 3 to 4 days, caterpillar about 10 to 14, chrysalis about 10 to 14, and an adult butterfly lives about two to five weeks. So from egg until the time the adult perishes, it's about 30 to 31 days. Well, that's a really short life cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and how many caterpillars actually survive to form chrysalises? You know, I don't have an exact number on that. Um, it is something I will look up, and when I do future, 10-Minute Monarch Marbles, be sure to answer that question. So very good question. You Great. stumped me with that one. Yes, because someone was wondering why um, they have milkweed in their yard, but they don't get any caterpillars. And um, what, what would a predator for a caterpillar be? 
Well, most likely it's going to be ants. And the ants uh, generally will attack the eggs before you ever even know the eggs are there. And there are some tricks to help protect uh, the um, eggs from ants, uh, such as netting over the entire milkweed. Uh, once you found that there is an egg there, there are other, uh, other people have sworn by using Vaseline on the stems of the milkweed. But it is something you have to keep up with, especially if it rains or gets moist, to make sure that the ants can't go up and down the stalk. Well, everyone, I really appreciate your questions. I appreciate you spending time with me and hope you join us next time for another 10-minute Monarch Marvel.